Good morning, everyone. My name is Kiwi Tan. This morning, I'm going to give you a lecture on what I think will happen in the next few months. Give me a minute while I share screen. The title of my talk is The Great Reversion. That means the world moving back to a state where it came from before. I start by showing you a photograph. What do you see? Do you see a dog running towards you or you see a man running into the forest? Some of you might see one or the other or both. Now this photograph is actually uh, sort of modern day version of a famous rabbit duck illusion drawing, which was first uh, issued by a German magazine way back in 1892. The, the, the question was, what do you see? Some people see a duck, some people see a rabbit. Now, this is important, you see, because if let's say both of us are chefs and we want to do something about it. If you think this is a duck, and then what would you do? You would go around collecting the ingredients so that you could prepare and cook a roast duck. But if you think that it is a rabbit, then you go around collecting ingredients to cook a rabbit stew. Now, this is important. And this was highlighted by a British Austrian a philosopher, uh, Wittgenstein, who uh, came out with a book in 1953, whereby he basically said that the things that we interpret in life, you know, because we both, all of us see it differently, it can lead to arguments. For instance, if you say that uh, uh, you love your wife and you demonstrate it by buying her a dinner once a week, whereas for her, Love for her means that you must take out the trash every night. And because you all have different definitions of what we mean by love, you can end up with arguments. Now, this applies not just between couples, but between uh, countries. What do you mean by democracy? What do you mean by capitalism? And so um, we all get into arguments and fights because when we see things, we see things differently. Before I continue, I would like you to read this. And basically it's saying that what you're gonna hear in the next few minutes is basically my view. I could be wrong, but uh, this is what I see. Let's begin, uh, look at last year. What happened last year? What, what does last year mean to us? To some of us, it means that uh, uh, there was a revolution or near revolution in the US Capitol, or the waving goodbye of Trump, everyone will have different recollections of 2020. But I think most of us will remember 2020 as the year of the COVID-19. That pandemic has hurt a lot of economies. Uh, just give an example of uh, the impact on the US economy. As you can see, this red part here, this is the impact on the US economy. And as you can see, it is worse than the Lehman Brothers crisis in 2009. But compared to another crisis way back the Second World War, it is not as bad as a crisis in the Second World War. Things are improving, fortunately. And the latest figures show that, well, the number of global cases have come down. Well, let's hope this little upturn doesn't continue. Well, mainly because there's news of vaccines being used. And uh, if they are effective, then good for us. If not, then we should see more pain down the road. What's the damage so far? Well, about two and a half million people have died. 
And of course, compared to all the other flus in the past decades, it is not that much. Okay, the Hong Kong flu had 1 million deaths. But of course, you compare to the Spanish flu, which was almost 100 years ago, then of course, this uh, COVID-19 death is, uh, is actually much smaller. So the impact on our lives uh, is small compared to the Spanish flu. So the question is, when will this COVID-19 become harmless? Uh, well, everyone will have their own opinions and I will also throw in my guess. I'm using an, my economic models and according to my models, the world should have picked up into a bigger cycle from September last year. This is the chart showing the S&P 500. Beginning of the 2020, it fell. Then the Fed liquidity pushed up. And then around September, when they came up with a few potential vaccines, that's when things started to pick up again. Are the markets uh, too high now? Well, by historical PE ratio figures, it looks high. It's about 40 now. And the historical average for S&P 500 is about 16. So I would be a bit careful about jumping the stock markets right at this moment. If I expect a correction first, and after this correction, um, I think uh, the global economy will pick up. As far as virus is concerned, I think that as spring turns warmer, the virus will mutate into something less harmful and uh, give it a few months for a lot of uh, backlog uh, problems to, to address itself, you know, because in the past year, there have been a lot of mortgage holidays and rent holidays. Give it three to six months to address itself. Then I see the global economy picking up from autumn. <clears throat> Even with the global economic recovery, the world has been transformed. Some sectors of the economy will remain hit, like cruise liners. Uh, not many people will dare to jump back into a cruise liner so soon. Um, and of course, some sectors will thrive during the pandemic. This is the computer sector. And I'm sure they'll continue to grow because maybe working from home and using uh, uh, gadgets will be our more of a way of life going forward. But as far as homes are concerned, city homes are now being uh, vacated. Most people prefer to maybe work from home or even uh, work far, far away. And so country homes are now uh, prized. So we have a two sector economy. For instance, if you look at the share of Amazon, uh, it has uh, gone up during, even during the pandemic in 2020. It never really fell, kept on going up. So uh, people like Jeff Bezos is a very happy man. On the other hand, if you are uh, in the services industries like the airlines, then you have been hit badly. This is American Airlines fell from $30 all the way down to 10 in the midst of the crisis last year. Then since September last year, it's been slowly picking up to close about $21 recently. Well, unlike Jeff Bezos, uh, a lot of pilots or ex-pilots have to find new professions. So we have a two-sector economy. But we also now have a two-sector global economy. Because some certain countries or many countries have been devastated by the pandemic, but certain countries have thrived. 
Okay, one example is uh, China. Whereas all the other countries in this chart has registered negative growth for last year, China grew 2.3% last year. So it seems that the West will take more time to recover from the pandemic. Give an example, US GDP growth rate. Um, since this is a pandemic area, it has fallen, it has picked up, but still it's not back to pre-pandemic levels. It's the same with US jobless rates. It shot up in the early part of 2020, has now improved, but it hasn't gone back to the pre-pandemic levels. Well, these developed countries have been hit. That's because they rely a lot on their services industries. And that's inevitable as a country develops, more and more of the jobs are found actually in the services industries. And of course, all governments have been trying to help. Europe has come up with 750 billion euros and Joe Biden has, has, come, has come up with 1.9 trillion in stimulus too, to, to boost the US economy. This is on top of the 3.7 uh, trillion, which uh, the Trump administration has given out uh, during his term. All this stimuli is good, but it leaves everyone heavily indebted. For instance, if we look at the global debt to GDP ratio, okay, this includes households, non-financial firms and government, in 2020, it sort of shot up from 320 to 365. So as a percentage of GDP, so that is a significant increase. When it comes to government debt, well, of course, uh, they are not better off. Let's look at Britain. Britain's debt to GDP ratio shot up to about 200% way back in the 1800s. That was during the war with the French. The British won, and then after that, the economy improved. In the Second World War, it deteriorated to 250%, and after the war, it improved again. Right now, the UK government debt to GDP ratio is approaching 100%. The US, not far behind, has been okay. Second World War is shot up to 120%. Then it improved after the war, and in the past uh, few years, it's gone up again to 120%. So they are in, well, deep in debt. Let's look at the equivalent figure for China is 52%, so almost half of UK and US. So the East is slightly better, maybe because they were strict, the economy has opened much faster. Look at Chinese GDP growth. Well, for the fourth quarter of last year, it's picked up and almost back to pre-pandemic levels. It's the same with the manufacturing output. It has recovered strongly, and now it's all back to where it was before the pandemic struck. There are three reasons why China is doing well. Number one, the COVID has closed a lot of Western factories. And so they can't do anything about it. And in the past few years, there's been this migration to other countries as a manufacturing hubs, Vietnam, Mexico. But unfortunately, their capacity is not as big as China and they've all reached their max. And of course, Chinese factories are operating near their normal level scale. So that's why these are three reasons why China is doing relatively well. Foreign direct investments into China last year increased a bit compared to a global uh, figure, which is minus 42%. Going ahead, I believe that Asia will continue to do better, not only because it handled COVID well, but there are other reasons. The first one, this trade war between US and China has taught China that maybe it is not too smart to rely solely on their overseas markets. So a year ago, China came out with this 
dual circulation uh, phrase, whereby basically it means that um, let's cut our dependence on selling to the export markets abroad. Let's try to import less technology. And you know, they, 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 they are trying to stop China from buying uh, semiconductors, et cetera, from abroad. And of course, encourage domestic spending. So the focus now is on China's domestic market. Well, basically, the whole, any economy will have three sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. Let's look at China. This is the light gray region. The light gray region is the services industries of China. As you can see, the past 10 years, it has been growing larger and larger, 54% in two years ago. Manufacturing has also decreased and uh, agriculture has more or less sort of stable for the past uh, many years. Let's compare this with a developed country like, let's say, Britain. In Britain, the services industry is oh, almost 80%. So that's why I'm trying to say in uh, developed economies, the services industry is far greater. Okay. So China is trying to boost the domestic market and usually covers a lot of services industry. So there's a lot of room to grow for the Chinese economy. Another thing, when the economy matures, usually it's household consumption grows in tandem too. So let's look at this chart. This shows that household consumption as a proportion of GDP for China is about 40%. Whereas for the other developed countries, it's far higher. So again, it shows that China, Chinese domestic market has a lot of room to grow. So it's good for business men who is thinking of China. Another trend which is happening in China is urbanization. This urbanization is basically a measure of how many people live in the cities. And in the US, it's 82% of the population lives in the city. In China, the equivalent figure is 55%. So again, as China matures and grow, there's a lot of room uh, for business opportunities. Besides China, the other Asian economies are quite similar because they all started out as, as exporting countries. And so there is a lot more potential for Asian countries compared to other parts of the world. China is not only focusing on itself, but it's also looking at her neighbors. And it's not just China. Most countries of the world are also looking into Asia. There are a few reasons why. Number one, the trade war has changed the global mindset of many people. All these uh, uh, barriers put up by Trump, you know, stopping China from buying certain technologies, stopping Chinese firms from listing in uh, New York Stock Exchange. Uh, this has uh, left a very sour taste in many, many businesses. So their response is, well, we will have to pack up and go elsewhere. Next. This crisis has shown to us that Western liberal democracies may not be so practical when it comes to addressing COVID-19 because uh, people, there are many people who feel that they have the right not to wear masks and they have to feel that they have the right to, to continue to socialize. In China, it, as you know, it's very, very different. Measures can be very, very strict, but uh, it helps. And now people are probably thinking, maybe when it comes to addressing COVID-19 or any pandemic, future pandemic, a, a liberal country may not be the answer. This brings us back maybe 30 years ago, when that time the world was asking the question, which is better, a planned economy or capitalist economy? And when USSR collapsed in 1991, 
the world realized that as far as making money and growing an economy, maybe a state planned economy isn't practical. And as a result, the USSR collapsed. A lot of countries, namely India, decided to open its economy and move towards capitalism. Again, the reaction is, let's move on. Thirdly, in the past year or two, there's been a lot of um, anger towards Asians. And uh, I'm sure those friends of yours and many people I know who live in, uh, in the West, they're feeling the, uh, the pain of being uh, ostracized. Again, a lot of, for them, the reaction is, let's move on. Where are they all moving to? Well, the destination is Asia, it seems. A lot of companies, a lot of businesses are now looking towards Asia for future growth. This has been supported by a recent trade deal signed in November last year with 15 countries. It is the largest trade bloc in history. If you compare, it is bigger than the EU, and it's far bigger than the US, Canadian, Mexican trade bloc. And just three months ago, EU quickly signed a deal with China uh, to open its uh, investment flows. Now, this will benefit Europe a lot because right now, EU investment into China is less than 10% of its investment to USA. So there's a uh, lots of room to grow for EU wanting to invest in China. And China is EU's third largest market. Again, a lot of room to grow. This China-EU deal is again good for China's Belt and Road Initiative. This was started like eight years ago. And basically it was China's idea to link uh, the, uh, the interior of Asia with China and right to the far shores of uh, Western Europe. Again, this is a very big uh, agreement or block if it takes off. Now the question is, this trade war that we saw in the past few years, is it over? Well, Joe Biden seems to give the impression that he is uh, embracing all forms, all races in the States. He gave a very nice uh, New Year greeting to Chinese living in Asia. But uh, if you look further, mm. it seems to contradict what he has just said. During his inauguration, he invited a representative from Taiwan to the event. Now, I mean, Taiwan is not supposed to be a recognized country by the USA or by the United Nations. So to invite a representative to his inauguration is like trying to tell China something. On top of that, all his key appointments, if you look at it in the past few months, seem to be sounding anti-China statements. So maybe, the, this US-China trade war will continue. Why is this so? I put it down to, well, the youth of a country. The, the Americans are um, like young men, and like young men, they think that they are morally superior. And they believe that they have the right chosen by divine mandate to spread democracy and take what they want by force. In other words, they want to continue with what Rudyard Kipling says, the white man's burden, which is to teach the rest of the world what is civilization, what is uh, all the good things that 18th, 19th century Britain wanted to impose on the rest of the world. So the question is, why, why would you think that the Americans think that way? I suppose it's conditioning. Remember the 
uh, rabbit duck illusion, they found that during Easter, more people see a rabbit first than a duck. And during the autumn when ducks are flying around, more people see ducks first than rabbit. So for some reason, Americans have been led to believe that they have the, the right to tell us what to do. Well, all countries face that situation anyway. Give an example. Even way back when America was born, George Washington was quite clear that the Native Americans need to be uh, removed and uh, dealt with. This so-called tradition actually went on for over to over 150 years, and George Bush uh, was acting in the same spirit as well. He felt that it was his Americans' right to design Iraq according to what they saw fit. Obama is no different. After getting his Nobel Peace Prize, he launched strikes on seven countries. Now, I'm not saying the Americans are bad. I think it's just that the country is young. And if you look at the Chinese go back 2,000, 5,000 years, they were equally aggressive and greedy and brutal. So it's just a human condition. When did the USA started to dislike China? Some people think that maybe, okay, well, the US is after all, is the biggest economy in the world. What is there to be jealous about? Well, some people think that it actually started maybe in 2010 when Chinese manufacturing output exceeded US manufacturing output. Was four years later in 2014, Chinese GDP in terms of purchasing power parity uh, overshot USA. And now we are, a lot of people are take, saying that in six years time, the Chinese economy would overtake the US economy in nominal terms. And it's because of this conflict, the rising power, incumbent power, that people have been using this to see this trap, which is an ancient uh, analysis of when a rising power appears, the incumbent power will want to wage war to control the rising power from coming. So for many years, some people believe that a war between China and USA is in the cards. I don't think so. I hope not. I could be wrong. But I think that the US will collapse on its own. But how? Well, if you look at it since 1945, the US has been number one. And it's been number one because of one thing. The basis of US superpower is the US dollar. Previous empires, when they became, when they want to get rich, they conquer others grab their stuff, and they became rich. But for the US empire, they just print US dollars and buy things up. Of course, they also indulge in certain wars, but in the main, it's the US dollar that is behind the strength of the US empire. So the US military is supposed to defend US values, right? But I take a different view. I think the US military, its sole purpose is to defend the US dollar. Why is the US dollar so important? There are three reasons. Number one, we all need to use the US dollar. We use it to buy everything, palm oil, rubber, tin, silver, gold, and of course, underlying all this is oil. And this is the basis of the petrodollar system, whereby the whole world is sort of uh, forced to buy things using the US dollar. And of course, Saudi Arabia is the key player in this petrodollar system. 
you can see how effective it has been. Almost 60-70% of all trades in the forex market involves the US dollar. And the Chinese yuan makes up only less than 5% of all forex trades. So the US dollar domination is total. Second reason, the US can print US dollars anytime it wants to solve its problems, and it has done. You know, during the dot-com crisis, during the 9-11, during the 2008 subprime crisis, all they did was to cut interest rates, starting from here. Okay. Third reason, the US controls the transfer of US dollars through SWIFT. What is SWIFT? SWIFT is a European Belgium uh, international body whereby all transactions, whether you're sending money from this guy to this guy, you have to go through SWIFT. So if I'm sending US dollars from Singapore to uh, Hong Kong, I will need to go through SWIFT. And because it's US dollars, I'll fall under US laws. And so if the US government says, sorry, I'm not allowed to send US dollars from Singapore to Hong Kong, I'm stuck. SWIFT is great, but of course, like I said, the US has weaponized it and they've used it against many countries. And of course, many other countries are affected by such sanctions. For instance, Europe uh, wants to avoid this by coming up with their own SWIFT system, the Chinese as well, and the Russians as well. But the trouble is their systems are not really popular, and so they have a long way to catch up with SWIFT. Okay, let's recap. Three reasons why the US dollar is important. We all need to use the US dollars. The US can print US dollars anytime, and US controls the transfer of US dollars through SWIFT. As a super tool, the US dollar has been overused. And as you can see, in the past year or two, uh, the US Fed has been printing lots of money. How much? This chart will frighten you. This is year 2020. And at that time, they had $4 trillion in M1. Within the space of a year, that increase has gone up 40% to $7 trillion. Of course, this is just M1. If you're talking about real money, uh, created by the banking system, that's many, many multiples of this. And all this money printing has only one effect of reducing the purchasing power of US dollars. From 1913, a dollar in 1913 is worth maybe three or two cents today. For years, you know, the US Fed has been doing that. And for years, people are saying, hey, the US dollar will collapse, but it has not, it has not, okay? This is a chart showing the US basket against uh, the rest. And it's gone down, up, down, up and down in this latest few years. The question is why has the US dollar survived? The answer is simple. There's no alternative to the US dollar. When the US dollar overtook the sterling pound. There was no other currency in the world to rival it. Until the 80s, we had the Japanese yen coming in. But they fixed the Japanese economy through the Plaza Accord. 10, 20 years ago, another contender appeared, and this is the Euro. And well, you know what happened to the Euro, right? The Greek debt crisis, fix the euro for good. There are many reasons why it happened. Some say the Greeks spent too much, tax too little. An alternative view is that the US banks uh, fixed Greece by lending them too much money. And so they had, they had no choice but to fail. And when Greece failed, the whole euro experiment failed. In recent years, another currency has appeared. And of course, it's no other than the 
Chinese yuan. The Chinese economy could have been derailed too in the past year or two by COVID. But thankfully for China, it thrived. Some people, these are the conspiracy theory, think that the virus was planted in China to sabotage the Chinese economy. No one will know the truth of the matter, but I just brought it up so they understand what's been talking. China has recently introduced the digital yuan, well, not, not to the world yet, but experimental stage. Now, what is this digital yuan? This is the present current banking system. Our money goes through banks and banks will go to a central bank. This digital yuan is the future whereby we don't need all the banks in between. All we need is just uh, download the app in your smartphone and then you deal straight away with the central bank. <clears throat> you can send money to your friends, to businesses, all without going through the bank. Well, no one knows what the final form of the digital yuan will take, but uh, most probably it will not uh, cut out the middleman because it seems that China will want to retain the banks. And why would China want to do that or central bank do that? Well, it's just like airlines. They don't want to cut off uh, their travel agents. You know? by only selling tickets online. They want, maybe they find their agents useful. And so maybe Chinese central bank will find Chinese banks useful when they finally launch the digital yuan. Now the question is, why is China planning a digital yuan? There are many reasons. Number one, they want sovereignty. Right now, WeChat Pay and Alipay dominate the payment system. Central bank doesn't really like that. And so it wants to cut them out. Secondly, a lot of Chinese do not have access to the banking system, especially in the poor Western, Northern regions. So this digital yuan is to close the gap. Thirdly, this is another way of addressing the black market because uh, Apparently this digital yuan can be traced. So if you are selling drugs or harmful substances, uh, the government will know what you're doing. And another thing uh, is to stop the rich Chinese from siphoning money out of China because with digital yuan, uh, it can be traced. So before the digital yuan is uh, introduced in about a year's time, expect more money to flow out of China. Lastly, fourth, question, fourth answer, internationalization of the yuan. China wants to do that, has been trying to do that for the past 20 over years or building up a momentum for it. So let's cover again the four advantages of a digital yuan, sovereignty, access to the poor, black market, and to internationalize the yuan. When will this digital yuan replace the US dollar? Well, now we are guessing. It's going to be launched in a year's time in the Winter Olympics, China said. Okay, And once it's launched, uh, it should grow in popularity, not only in China, but all over the world. Because can you imagine? A South American uh, businessman can send money to China through this app. You do not need to go through SWIFT and it is much cheaper. But of course, China must challenge the dominance of the US dollar and SWIFT. I told you, right? Chinese uh, forex uh, transactions only like less than 5% and SWIFT is the dominant uh, gateway for US dollar. So China has a lot to do to make it before it makes its currency very popular. But a month ago, something happened interesting. 
SWIFT and China started a joint venture. And SWIFT wants to help China uh, send money all over the world. This is actually big news if this joint venture goes ahead and SWIFT actually helps China to uh, uh, do all the digital yuan transactions. Because if SWIFT is on board, then China has one less obstacle to overcome. This obstacle could be surmountable easily. I'll give you an example. Uh, these are all the social media that's ever, uh, that's very popular. Within the first four years, Facebook had 145 million people. WhatsApp, within the first four years, had 419 million users. WhatsApp is so popular because it's so useful. Now, the digital yuan could be the same. Yeah? When it gets introduced in one year's time, the world might find it so convenient that they might start using the digital yuan more than the US dollar. Just for your curiosity, the number of WhatsApp users today is 2.7 billion. Recently, Joe Biden's government has been irritating Saudi Arabia, saying that the war in Yemen is not nice. They might not sell them any more arms, that, that Saudi Arabia is abusing their human rights. And then recently, the US accused many of MBS men of murdering Khashoggi. Now, uh, MBS is a young man and he could be irritated. Now, he is key to the petrodollar system because Saudi Arabia has always refused to sell oil to China in renminbi. It's always in US dollar. Maybe out of spite, MBS might say, okay, from tomorrow, I will sell my oil to China in renminbi. And that would undermine the whole dollar system. Next question, why can't the US come out with its own digital dollar? Well, as of today, about 30 countries are rushing to come up with their own digital currencies. The US is way behind. China is way ahead. So why? Maybe it's complacency, whatever. But the US hasn't... Uh, I thought that uh, digital currency is in that important. Now, a country, a currency's popularity depends on trade. And right now, RCEP and BRI are going to be the biggest trade blocks in years to come. And the US is not involved in both of them, which means that those involved in this trading will find it uh, not practical to use US dollar if the US continues to stay out of these two blocks. Again, there's another reason that will undermine the popularity of the US dollar. So instead of battle between two armies, which some people are expecting, I think the real battle is between the two currencies. Okay, and if you think of population growth, middle class population size and all that, then it's easy to guess that the renminbi will win in time to come. What will this transition to the digital yuan look like in the years to come? Well, let's recap the three reasons why the US is important, the US dollar is important. Well, we all use it, okay? But if the renminbi becomes popular or the digital yuan becomes popular, then there's no need for US dollar. The US can continue print US dollar. Yes, it can. No one's gonna stop them. The US controls the transfer of dollars through SWIFT. Now, if SWIFT is working, going to work with China, then this is not a factor anymore. So what's happened, going to happen? In the past, we always imagined that you print a lot of US dollars, you lead to inflation, but it hasn't happened. Why? Okay, look at this. Since the 1980s, when the US inflation shot up to about 15%, uh, inflation has been tamed so far, despite all the massive amount of money printing. 
Well, the reason is simple. All the US dollar, a lot of US dollar has been created, has been spread throughout the world. A running tap cannot flood a field. And in fact, most of the money has been created over the years has been allocated to a very few people. And more than half of all the US dollar created is uh, outside the USA. In time to come, when the digital yuan becomes more popular and people use less and less US dollar, then for well, most of us, we don't need to have a US dollar account. And so the US dollars will return home. So it's like a running tap on the basin. Very quickly, the tap will overflow. In other words, inflation will hit the US economy. Biden's stimulus is also actually giving money to everyone. Okay, I like previous stimulus where only a certain small pro proportion of the population got the money. Okay, this is now spreading the money to all. And if the US economy continues to be performing below capacity, so all the money in that's flowing back will lead to higher prices. And of course, there's this Gresham's law, which says that bad money drives out good money. For us, if I have a choice between digital yuan and US dollar, and I think the US dollar is not going to be uh, worth much in years to come. What I will do is I will get rid of my US dollar by spending. So that's what we mean by bad money drives out good money. What does history teach us, teach us about uh, printing too much money? Well, throughout history, hyperinflation has been a factor. For the, the Roman Empire, the third century, it happened and then it led to the collapse of Western Roman Empire. But let's bring to a more recent example, German hyperinflation in 1921 and 1923. Hyperinflation is defined as something that above 50% in rate increase per month. In 1921-23, Germany had inflation of 30,000% per month and prices doubled every few days. <clears throat> How did that happen? Well, when Germany lost the war in 1918, it had to, under the Treaty of Versailles, they had to pay the victorious uh, enemies $55 billion in gold and silver. So of course, Germany tried to do. But uh, sooner or later, it ran out of money, ran out of gold and silver. But Germany still had to pay wages for civil servants and everything else. So it uh, resorted to printing money. And that's what the German Central Bank did. So later, prices rose. In 1921, a loaf of German bread cost 160 marks. A year later, it was two billion marks. German hyperinflation happened as well. And because of too much money. Now, the beauty of investing in stocks is that you are owning a fraction of the company. So even if there's hyperinflation, your stock price will go up. So inflation is basically normally good for stocks. And if you're into commodities like uh, gold, uh, in the inflation scenario, the price of your commodities will go up in price. Look at this German gold. In 1918, or, you know, it was like, uh, maybe three marks per ounce of gold. And then during the hyperinflation period, it went up to one trillion marks per ounce of gold. So inflation is good for commodities like gold. German hyperinflation, like in every hyperinflation in history, is bad for those with fixed salaries. This on your left is a picture of a German housewife uh, using their marks to as firewood for the kitchen. And on the right, this guy is using his marks as a wallpaper because it was cheaper than buying wallpaper. When there's high 
hyperinflation and inflation. Of course, the natural thing is that the exchange rate of the currency in trouble would fall. So the German mark did fall. In 1922, it was like 100 marks per US dollar. And before the end of 1923, it was like uh, 10 trillion marks per US dollar. So what happens when currency depreciates? Most central banks will try to protect the currency from depreciating. And what do they normally do? They raise interest rates. And when you raise interest rates, what happens? Everything falls. So if US economy faces hyperinflation in the years to come, central bank will have to raise interest rates. And when it, they do that, US stocks will fall, bonds will fall, even property will fall. And all those who are on US loans will have to pay higher interest rates and they will be hurt. All schemes depending on leverage and cheap US dollars will be in danger. Basically the whole market will implode. So history tells us that with hyperinflation, not only will the currency collapse, but the economy will collapse too. What can we do about it? Well, minimize your cash holdings, US dollar especially, and minimize all your investments that use US dollars. Of course, pile up onto commodities, because they are the ones that uh, um, thrive in an inflationary period. So the next question is, when will this implosion happen? Nobody knows. I also don't know, but I'm going to give a guess. The digital E1 will be introduced in one year's time. And let's assume that the digital E1 is very popular like the like WhatsApp was when it was first introduced. Now I'll give it maybe another year or two. So by 2023, the digital yuan would be, would might even overtake the US dollar in popularity. What we are witnessing these days is the rise and fall of great empires. If we go back 300 or 800 years, that was a time when China was king of the world. The Venetian Kublai Khan went there and found and learned many things about Chinese technology, Chinese food, everything Chinese. You go back uh, two to 500 years into India and they were also the king of their lands. But about two, three hundred years ago, the world changed. The Western colonial powers went over the East as the British took over India. And about the same time, a small force of British and French force managed to overcome the Chinese military and burn down the Peking Summer Palace. And ever since then, the world has been ruled by the West. 20% controlling the rest of the world. What we are seeing now is the great reversion. As the businesses move to the East, to Asia, you know, um, uh, the focus, the weight of the world will move to Asia. Of course, not all Asia will grow evenly. Some countries will have high-speed trains and some countries will have old-fashioned trains. But this is what's going to happen.
Thank you for sitting through my talk. Um, at the next slide, I'm going to show you a QR code. And if you wish to, please uh, donate to YWCA. Until then, thank you for your attention again, and I'll see you soon.